This is our third video about the gas laws, and in this gas law, I'm happy to say we get to combine all of the four individual gas laws that we've been talking about so far into one gas law that we call the ideal gas law. And it covers all of the changes that we want to um, be able to make to our variables, which include pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles. So remember that our proportionality statements were that pressure was inversely proportional to volume, and pressure was directly proportional to temperature, and volume was directly proportional to the number of moles, and the volume is also directly proportional to the temperature. And so all four of these proportionality statements mean that if we look at how to combine these together, it uh, converts that pressure multiplied by volume is proportional to some number multiplied by one, and that all of these three, that pressure and volume are both proportional to temperature, and volume is proportional to moles, which means that so must pressure be, it means that we have this proportionality statement that Pressure and volume are proportional to the product of the number of moles and the temperature of the system. And our proportionality constant can be combined, and it can actually be calculated. We aren't going to. But the proportionality constant that we're going to use is called the gas constant, and it gets the capital letter R. So our ideal gas law becomes pressure times volume is equal to the number of moles times the gas constant times the temperature. Now a lot of people say to me, what is the gas constant? Well, the gas constant is going to have units that relate with the pressure, the volume, the moles, and the temperature. So we remember that our temperature always has to be in Kelvin. And our number of moles, this is in moles. So the gas constant we the constant that we use, the units of the gas constant are going to depend on what pressure unit and what volume unit we use. So the units of the gas constant depend on the pressure and the volume units. And you just pick the gas constant value that you want based on what these units are. So uh, the three most common units that you will see, or the three most common versions of the gas constant are 0 0.083145, and these units are in liter bar per mole Kelvin. If you use atmospheres instead, it's 0 0.8206 liters atmosphere per mole Kelvin. And then you can also have 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin if we use an energy unit here instead. So sometimes we uh, do use an energy unit. And that is because one liter bar is equal to 100 joules. Now, these are not units that, or this is not a unit conversion that you need to memorize, and in fact, these gas constants are also not numbers that you need to memorize. Anytime you're doing a problem with a gas constant, you will be able to look up whatever gas constant number you need. So if it's on a quiz or an exam, I will give you a little key with any gas constant values you might possibly need. So. One of the useful reference points for us to talk about with the gas constant, now that we have the ideal gas uh, equation, is for us to talk about something um, that is sort of a reference point for gases. And it's called the standard temperature and pressure.
And so you'll often see people talk about it as STP. And so they'll say, at STP, blah, 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 something will happen. And the reason why standard temperature and pressure is um, useful is because gases tend to take up about the same amount of space, which we'll look at shortly, um, based on how much um, pressure we have and what the temperature is. And they aren't hugely sensitive to, to small pressure changes. So our standard temperature and pressure is defined as one bar of pressure and zero, excuse me, that's not at, and zero degrees Celsius, or in other words, 273.15 Kelvin. So one bar of pressure, zero degrees Celsius, that's our standard temperature and pressure. So we have a temperature, we have a pressure. And actually, our book says um, that they use one atmosphere of pressure and uh, zero degrees Celsius for standard temperature and pressure. So just so you know, that's what they're talking about. And the reason that they do that is because one atmosphere of pressure is pretty similar to one bar of pressure. And so you can kind of use one or the other more or less interchangeably because standard temperature and pressure is here as kind of a a general guideline for properties of gases rather than as an exact specification. So people who have an exact system in mind will give you the exact temperature and the exact pressure. Standard temperature and pressure is kind of a general, here's where we are kind of in a laboratory setting. And the reason why a laboratory setting is um, going to be like this, I mean, it's not going to be zero degrees Celsius, right, in your lab. That would be freezing. But you will have atmospheric pressure, which is about one atmosphere or about one bar in the laboratory. And that is what the pressure of the gases in your laboratory are going to be at. So this is why um, STP can be a useful concept. So one of the other reasons why people talk about this is because it gives you a general sense for how much space one mole of gas takes up. So let's explore that a little bit further. How much space, how much volume, does one mole of gas use at STP? Let's go ahead and calculate it, right? We can do that. We have the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. We're asking how much volume, so that means we're gonna solve for V. So V is equal to nRT over the pressure. And we have one mole of gas. We'll give ourselves a couple significant digits. Our gas constant, if we're using one bar of pressure, then it's going to be 0 0.083145 liter bar per mole Kelvin. And our, uh, let's see, temperature is 273.15 Kelvin. And our pressure is one bar. So if we solve for this, we will find that the pressure, or excuse me, the volume taken up by one mole of gas is 22.7 liters. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really think in liters. So I need to convert this into something that I can get my head around to figure out how big that is. So let's give that a try. Let's see. If I think about this, um, I might want to try to convert it into um, cubic inches. So then maybe I can figure out what this looks like, you know, like what a, a cube would be that has a volume of 22.7 liters. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So I'm going to convert liters into milliliters and then into cubic centimeters. Oops. I'll try and do it right. There we go. 
And then I need to remember that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. And if I'm converting a cube, I need to cube that whole thing. So if I go through this math, I am going to find, if I did my calculations correctly, that this is 1,385 cubic inches. I'm just going to double check that right now. Okay, I checked it, and yes, that works. So this is the same volume, but I want to know how big is each side. Oops, I got that unit. There we go. Just noticed. This is cubic inches. So if I take the cubed root of 1,385 cubic inches, this will give me the length of one side of a cube that has volume 1385 cubic inches. So if I do take that cube root, I got 11 inches. So I can visualize that. 22.7 liters is a box that has sides that are each 11 inches. It's a cube that's 11 inches on each side. All right, so I can visualize that. That's one mole of gas. Now, notice that I didn't specify what kind of gas we were doing, and we don't have to specify because any ideal gas will have these specific properties. Doesn't matter what it is. So it's time for us to actually talk about what we mean by an ideal gas. Because the ideal gas law is called the ideal gas law not because it's like the best gas equation ever, but because it gives us a, a measurement or you know it allows us to calculate things based on the properties of ideal gases. So what is an ideal gas? All right, so first we need to talk about how we envision gas particles. So we're breaking away now from our sort of old-fashioned view of um, our you know, four original gas laws to bring in some modern understanding of what gases are. So gases, uh, just in general, are individual particles, either atoms or mo molecules, depending on what kind of gas we're talking about. And um, each atom is visualized as vaguely spherical. But to extend that, ideal gases are considered to be uh, spherical or hard spheres specifically, they're not squishy. And they have mass but no volume. So they don't take up any space in our container. Obviously, that is not true. However, this is one of our first abbreviate or approximations for what ideal gases are. So, they are considered to have mass, but no volume. They always experience elastic collisions. Oh, I guess I actually need to back up. They always go in straight line paths. and they undergo elastic collisions. So 
if you haven't taken physics yet or you haven't taken it in a while, an elastic collision is where you have two particles that bounce into each other and they don't experience any friction. So they just bounce and no energy is lost uh, in the process of the bouncing. Not that energy is ever truly lost, but no energy is converted from kinetic energy into anything else. So all of that kinetic energy is conserved by those elastic collisions. Um, this is not a super critical thing for you to understand at this point. So if this is still feeling a little vague, don't worry about it. Just focus on the straight line paths and the fact that they are bouncing into each other and then bouncing off. So they undergo elastic collisions with surfaces and with each other. The other thing that we usually um, talk about in terms of ideal gases is that no chemical reactions occur and that doesn't mean we aren't going to use the ideal gas law with chemical reactions. We totally are. We're just going to pretend like there is there this sort of magical moment where first you have reactants and then boom, now you have products and we don't really consider the process of moving from one thing into the other. Um, or, you know, more likely what we're going to do is we're just going to focus on, oh yeah, we just want to look at the carbon dioxide that gets produced by this reaction. We're not actually going to worry about any of the other gases that might be involved. So this allows us to kind of ignore all of the rest of uh, what's going on in that system. So the reason why we don't want to have to worry about chemical reactions occurring is we don't want to have to worry about the changing number of moles. You know, as you convert like oxygen moles into carbon dioxide moles and water moles when you have a combustion reaction. So this one, um, I sort of hesitated to put it in here. Um, it is typically considered part of our definition of ideal gases, but we're also going to still talk about chemical reactions pretty soon. Anyhow, hopefully that won't be confusing. So when we're talking about ideal gases, the two things that we're really focusing on are this one, that our gases don't seem to take up any space and that they don't interact with each other. I'll just add it to this one too, because a chemical reaction is an interaction. All right, so we'll see this manifested a lot. We'll see some examples of how this is going to look um, as we keep going. But for now, let's just work with the equation that we have for right now, and we'll do a couple practice problems before we stop. All right, so uh, one example of a practice problem might be something like this. If 2.31 moles of an ideal gas have pressure of 3.42 bar and take up 7.31 liters of space, what is the temperature of the system? So for our simplest ideal gas calculations, we're going to have three out of our four variables. So pressure is a variable, volume is a variable, moles is a variable, and temperature is a variable. R is a gas constant, so it's always the same. So for our simplest equations, we're always just going to have three out of the four variables, and we're going to solve for the fourth one. So I'll usually rearrange the equation and solve for it. So we just plug it, plug in our values. Can you tell I like bar? It's true. I do. I'm not sure why, but I do definitely show a preference for writing problems with the unit of pressure in bar. So I'll try to be a little more varied in our homework and stuff. 
So when I solve this problem, I get 130 Kelvin. And I'm going to put my decimal place there to indicate that I have three significant digits. All right, so that was a really pretty straightforward problem. You might have a slightly more uh, interesting problem with something like this. So a gas with initial state Two hundred and thirty seven Kelvin, one point seven two atmospheres, and thirty one point two liters changes state to three point one nine atmospheres. and 17.6 liters. What is its new temperature? So there's a couple of ways to solve this problem and you are welcome to go about doing it any way you want to. So one way to do this would be first to use the initial state to calculate the number of moles. And, um, you know, because we have temperature, we have pressure, we have the volume. So this is all my initial state. And I'm going to just call this um, state A. And in state B, I just have the pressure and I just have the volume. So if I calculated the moles, then I could just solve for the new temperature. So that will work. And then solve for the second temperature. And if you want to do it that way, it's totally fine to do it that way. You can also do this um, with a little bit of algebra by recognizing that our moles stay the same, right? This is a closed system. So our moles in state A, our initial state, are equal to the number of moles in our final state. And the reason why this can be useful to us is because with our ideal gas law, PV is equal to nRT, this means that I can solve for the number of moles, that will be PV over RT, right? Now, um, since the moles in state A are equal to the moles in state B, that means that the pressure multiplied times the volume of state A divided by the gas constant times the temperature of state A is also equal to the same stuff for state B. And in this case, I actually can just cancel out the R's so if I'm willing to do a little bit more algebra, then I can just solve this in one step. So it's totally up to you, whatever you prefer. I'm going to demonstrate doing it this way. So I'm going to solve for this temperature. So my first step is going to be to multiply it out to here. And then I'm going to divide out the other parts, but I'll write out both steps. That's A. The main challenge when you're doing it with algebra like this is really keeping track of which things belong to state A and which things belong to state B. So color coding things is a good idea or really labeling like here I labeled this state A and down here these would be state B. So that way you make sure you keep your A's and your B's where they belong. So my temperature of state B now is going to be P sub B V sub B, now I'm going to multiply this temperature over, and I'm going to divide out these two guys. All right, so if I plug all my numbers in, these are my B values, so 3.19 atmospheres, 17.6 liters. My initial temperature is over here, 237 Kelvin. And then divide by my pressure, 1.72 atmospheres. 
and 31.2 liters. So the other thing that's a good idea is um, to think about what might be happening here. So I just kind of picked these numbers at random. And so if I think about what's going on here, I have my pressure increasing, but my volume is decreasing. So normally if I increase my pressure, my um, you know volume is going to decrease. And so I don't know how much of a change this is actually going to make. So if I calculate this, I'm, let's see, it looks like I get 248 Kelvin, if I can read my own handwriting, which means that our temperature went up a little bit, but not actually very much. We didn't have a huge change. So if we'd wanted to make a bigger change, then maybe we would have um, held our volume constant, for example, and then increased the pressure. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with ideal gases, and we're going to go next and start talking about how we use the ideal gas law to talk about chemical reactions. So hopefully this is feeling pretty solid so far. It's mostly pretty basic algebra, so I don't think it should be too hard. But if you are having any questions, please let me know, and I'd be happy to help out.